welcome. Thank you for joining us here at AmazingLove.org. And, uh, you know, it's been a dream of mine to reach people all across the world with a message of Jesus and his love. And so whether you're joining us from near or far, so glad that you're here. And uh, we'd love to hear what God is doing in your life. So if he's blessed you by this ministry, please email us at impact at amazinglove at gmail.com. If you'd like to support this ministry and make sermons like this possible every week ongoing, please go to amazinglove.org and go to our giving tab. But now may God bless you. May he guide you. May he speak into your life and direct you all through the power of his love. Thank you. friends, I believe we're living in a time where true greatness was never needed more. We're living in a time of unrest, whether in this country or the world, where again, true greatness was never needed more than it is right now. I want to talk to you about that, that true greatness is desperately needed, and oh, this is not a plug for any political party. Maybe you heard what happened in Nice, France. They're on Bastille Day. When many people were awaiting fireworks, someone had rented a truck just to plow through the crowd and 84 people died. 202 other people were injured. Two of the people who lost their life were natives from Texas. This is Sean and Brody Copeland. And what is needed going forward to confront terrorism? What is needed going forward in this country when there is unrest within? What is needed when it comes to the revival of Christianity in America, which I believe we need? I don't want another generation to rise up without the knowledge of Jesus. That's my heart, my friends. What is needed in our own families, our own church families, our own communities? I believe it's true greatness. So the question is, what is true greatness? I believe the world has a few things to say on what greatness is. In fact, I was watching an award show that was all about greatness called the ESPYs. And there I saw a, uh, a Craig Sager get the Jimmy Valvano Award. Uh, the Jimmy Valvano Award for Perseverance. I don't know what you know about Craig Sager, um, but his greatness is fighting the disease of leukemia. Uh, for, for many years, he has been battling it. In fact, he took 11 months off from sports reporting. Um, he had a bone marrow transplant and all the treatments and it's only recently that he's returned. We've heard lately that uh, this native from Batavia, Illinois, um, has not fought and won when it comes to cancer. Rather, his cancer is no longer in remission. So what is greatness? Battling a life-threatening disease. That's what those of the ESPYs think. Or I was watching the ESPYs and I, I think of, oh yeah, there's my uh, rubbing shoulders with greatness, by the way. And, me and Otto had a great time. But anyway, so I rub shoulders with greatness. Um, I, I was thinking of other great people. Well, I was thinking of LeBron James. He got the Male Athlete uh, Year uh, Award. Or I, I think of uh, the Home Run Derby. And, and I saw this guy, you know, Juan Carlos Stanton, who uh, hit 40 home runs and some over 400 feet. And, and how people just love the All-Stars. Or Chris Bryant, who hit a home run at the All-Star Game. And a lot of just great figures. Um, I consider uh, people who entertain us as great. I don't know if anyone's seen the, the Secret Life of Pets and this bunny, a uh, voice of Kevin Hart. That's a great bunny, you know. 
Or maybe you look at companies and, and you see what Tesla's doing and, and the things and the advances they're making and, and Elon Musk and, and SpaceX. Or maybe you look at Apple and a Tim Cook and you're saying, wow, that this must be what true greatness is. But let me ask you, going forward for what we need now, is it really about more sports victories? Is it really about superior athleticism that we truly need today? But let me ask you, going forward, is what's truly needed more kids' blockbusters? Just a little bit more entertainment. That's, that's going to solve it. Or what's truly needed, is it really about bigger business and companies? I don't think so. So today I wanted to peer into God's book, the Bible. And I want to put God's, le God's lens on what greatness is. And so at this time, I wanted to welcome you again. If you're new to Amazing Love, if you don't consider yourself a Christian, uh, today might be drinking out of a water hose. I'm just going to be honest. Because we're going to fly at you a lot of truth of what we believe God says about what greatness is. And a lot of this can't be done without him, we believe. Uh, so you're welcome to be here and ask questions, but we're glad that you're here. And for us who are here who are Christians, uh, I just hope that we'd be inspired to be these things. Because greatness, I believe, is needed now. And greatness should start with us. So let's get into the story. We're going to turn to Abram's story. Um, again, if you weren't here last week, please go online and catch up. Uh, it was a great kickoff for the story. And what Abram does in this account, I believe they could make a Hollywood movie out of. Uh, this is the first recorded battle in the Bible. So again, we have a villain, we have a hero. Um, uh, Abram is going to take 318 men against thousands of other people. And, and so that is a, a truly great um, even quest to, to go on. But let's see what it plays out for Abram, what he does and why he does it, and let's learn from this account. So I invite you to read with me Genesis chapter 14. I'll read the whole thing here. It says, The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and they went away. They also came and carried off Abram's nephew Lot in his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre. The Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night... Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. So he, he goes 100 miles and pursues him 50 miles further yet. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and all the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Ketelomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With a raised hand I had sworn an oath to God, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and share the belongings to the men who went with me to honor Eshkel and Mamre. Let them have their share. This is the word of God. So Abram goes on the quest, and did he win? Sure did. We want to learn from his victory today and may God inspire us to be what is truly great. Dear friends, I will never forget the time my email account was hacked and everyone I knew got this message that said, help, I'm stuck in London, please send money. Because many of my friends, first unbeknownst to them, thought, how did he get to London? I just saw him on Friday. And second of all, I wondered, like, like how much money does he want and why is this the case? And that's kind of weird coming from pastor. And uh, I'll never forget, if you ever question how many friends you truly have, just let this happen. Because um, I had email responses and I had phone calls coming in saying, hey, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm here in Frankfurt. What's up? But one of the responses will always stick with me. Because one of the phone calls, one of the people who picked up the phone to ask who I was, was someone who I thought I had offended. 
Someone who I thought maybe would have had reason to write me off and not care about who I was based on something that I had done. So when that person picked up the phone thinking I was in London and asked how he could help, that kind of thing stuck with me. That kind of thing made a difference. Has it ever happened to you where you had reason, you gave offense to someone, and you could tell that person was still kind and still wanted your best interest? Those kind of things are truly great. In fact, that's the first point I wanted to share with you. I I believe that greatness overlooks offense to help in time of need. Greatness overlooks offense to help in time of need. And I need to set it up with Abram and Lot. What we didn't consider in this story is how Abram and Lot separated. Let me tell you, let me teach you a little bit about this story. See, they were both gaining in in possessions, whether it be in cattle or in people, um, and their parties were going larger and larger to the point where they had to separate because there was infighting between their parties, between the people who wanted the same pasture lands. So in this account earlier in Genesis chapter 13, Abram who would have had authority and superiority, who just had Lot as a tag-along, he says this to Lot. He says, let's not have any quarreling between you and me. It's not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked around, and he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord. And you want to know where he chose to live? in the best portion, in the portion that was like the garden of the Lord, even though he was an underling, even though he didn't have superiority or rank, Abram let him take what was best. Now why does that matter? Because when Lot is stolen by King Ketelomor, I can barely pronounce it, um, when when Lot is stolen, Abram could have said this, he could have said, you know what, Um, he made his bed, let him lie in it. You know what, I remember Lot that day, and there was something about his heart that was just cold, and so maybe he has some tough life lessons to learn. But that's not at all Abram's response, is it? No. Abram doesn't say what happened in the past. He overlooks an offense to help in time of need. Let's talk about our country a little bit. What is necessary for us who there's some infighting going on? What is necessary for police officers to continue risking their lives for the sake of those who are targeting them? It's going to have to be that. What about those who are victims of racism? Those who have been truly hated and put down based on the color of their skin or their socioeconomic status or whatever? What's needed going forward? Isn't it that? What's needed in a country where we never see more politically divided, where one side hates the other side and demonizes the other side, to create anything of significance in this country going forward. Isn't isn't this what is needed? And if we want revival in this country for Christianity, you know who's going to have to lead the way? It is us who are Christian. Who even though we are offended or put down or our freedoms are infringed upon, we're going to have to overlook offenses to continue to care for people. This is the path forward, my friends. I wonder how much this even speaks to our own families. How many of our own family members do we need to say, I'm going to overlook the offense and yet still love you because it's what you need right now? How much is that necessary in our church? This is what's hugely important, I believe, at this time. You know, I recently uh, went to the Billy Graham Museum. Has anyone ever been there? Billy Graham Museum. It's in Wheaton. No one's been there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> field trip. Anyway. Um, and and I, was, uh, I was really inspired based on all the people that Billy Graham could reach. In fact, at one moment, he reached 1.1 million people in Seoul, South, South Korea. Look at this picture. Um, when I go to Wrigley, there's like 40,000 maybe. This is 1.1 million People. The logistics of that just drives me nuts. It boggles my mind. And as I heard Billy Graham recount what, what his mission was about and, and why God used him, it, it was this, this idea, this compelling reason that he believes the simple gospel, when proclaimed with authority, can change hearts and lives. 
The simple gospel can, can change hearts and lives, whether it be in Seoul, Korea, or in France, or wherever it is. That same truth is here today. And what is the simple gospel? Is it not this? <laughs> is it not a God who said, I know all the reasons that you've offended me. I know all the things that should get in the way of our relationship, but I overlooked them today, and I come down for you to remove them once and for all. And there is no sweeter gospel than this. Look at this. While we were still sinners, the offenders, still when it was happening, that he had every reason to cast us aside, every reason to give up, and every reason to, to match hate with hate, he dies for us. He doesn't just wish us well. He doesn't just give mere words. He gives his life. This is the gospel that brings joy to us today. This is the reason I stand in a right standing with God and why you can too. Do you know this day you can be at peace with the holy God all because of Jesus Christ. He has forgiven your offense, removed it once and for all. And this is again what should fuel us going forward. Why shouldn't we, in response, do the same as what Jesus did for us, dear friends? And how much isn't this needed? But greatness doesn't stop there. Next point about greatness is this, that I believe greatness is doing good things, not motivated by reward. Doing good things, not motivated by reward. Let's look in again at what Abram was going to do in verse 14. Look with me there. Verse 14, it says, He heard that his relative had been taken. And he called out 318 trained men born of his household and went in pursuit. Now, 318 men, we know Abram didn't have any children of his own. Do you know in that age was voluntary servanthood? Many people could come to Abram, a great rich man, and say, I I'm going to serve you with my life, but you're going to provide community protection and providence. And so that's some of the men that I believe are gathered. That's just a tangent here. Um, but at this point, he doesn't know how the battle's going to go. We don't know how many kings and, and armies Ketelomer had. We don't know if it was in the thousands, but 318 versus kings that had defeated other kings, that's extreme. At the moment Abram decides to do this, he has everything to lose, and the only thing to gain is a spoiled brat named Lot who chose first. But he does it anyway. He does it because he's compelled by what is right, by what is good. You know, a similar story came to the news this past week, uh, not of Abram, um, but of a young lady in Detroit, a nine-year-old girl named Sammy McLaughlin. Uh, maybe you heard what she did with her birthday money. She had $70 for her birthday, and she thought a good thing to do would be to feed the Detroit police officers a free lunch. Not only did she do that, but after that she served in a homeless shelter, giving out 30 different meals uh, to people on her birthday. Look at her heart. Her heart said this, What I want for my birthday was to feed the homeless and the officers so they can know that all lives matter and they can know I care about everyone in this world. If that isn't the heart of God, I don't know what is. Because I don't know what you know about Jesus. But a passage says, God so loved the world that he sent his son. A passage says that I want all men to be saved and all women to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The heart of God says all lives matter because I've paid for each and every one and I want them all to be saved. And true greatness was this girl willing to give up birthday money. With nothing in return, not motivated by reward. You know, it reminds me of people in my own life. Um, I'm in a pastor's network, so I, I know really awesome pastors. One of them was former district president uh, David Richo. And uh, my wife worked at the school, so this is kind of near and dear to us. And he served as district president, and, and he would make called workers, you know, available for certain congregations. If a congregation was in a tough spot, he would counsel with them. And, um, and, he, and he still just serves in an incredible way. And he stepped down recently from this role. And, and part of me was like, what did he get? Was there, was there like a gold watch given? or uh, I th think I saw like a fish sweatshirt given or something. But, but like, w what did he get and why did he do it? 
He wasn't motivated by reward. And, and I believe at his heart he doesn't care what he gets. Serving the Lord was his privilege. But I say, man, that is good. I had a chance to meet with my, my dad and mom and my dad whose heart still beats for reaching those who don't know Jesus. That's why they started a school. And my mom says, I'll help. And so she's going to be a preschool teacher coming out of retirement because that's what needs to happen. Um, don't you just love people who do the good thing not motivated by reward? Do you know anyone like that? Do you have a mom or a dad or someone in your family? Do you have a, a teacher, someone who, who came across your path? And wouldn't you recognize this day and proclaim it, that that is greatness? Isn't there anything in us that recognizes it is great to do it? So let's do that. These are your marching orders this week. Go out and do something good just because it's good. Go out and do something right just because it's right. Go out and do something lovely and noble and pure just because they are lovely and noble and they're pure and you can do it. And maybe this isn't about mounting an army and doing a rescue mission. That'd be incredible if you did. But maybe it's a simple thing like being kind to someone who is mean or forgiving those in a traffic thing or, or, or helping those who you know need help. If we continue to do these great things, the world can change bit by bit and God can use us to do it. But this is hard. And all of us limp along because we're hindered by something that's found in all of us called a sinful nature. And a sinful nature will always say, don't do for them what you could do for you. And don't care about their point of view until they first care about yours. And we need to wrestle with that sinful nature in these moments together and say, this is not the path to greatness. I was reading from Charles Swindoll who said this. He said, if I were to boil down all the characteristics of greatness in a single word, it'd be humility. But our sinful nature fights humility with selfishness. Our sinful nature wants to be heard. And today's the day then just to repent. To say, Lord, I want to be done with selfishness. I want that to be in my past and living for others in the future. I want to care more about their needs rather than my own. I, I want to leave that here and through the cross of Jesus be forgiven and then the cross of Jesus be renewed. Because isn't Jesus our humble servant? Isn't he the epitome of true greatness? The cross wasn't about what was in it for him. The cross was what about what was in it for you. May we continue to strive like Jesus to be great and to put ourselves down. But one last point of greatness. See, Abram's not done teaching us. The last thing I want to consider with you is this. That greatness, I believe, is returning glory and goods to God. Returning glory and goods to God. See, what happens with Abram is he, he makes the victory. He does the impossible. He goes 100 miles defeating the army. He goes another 50 miles conquering them, bringing everything back. And the king Melchizedek comes out. Look what Melchizedek says, verses 19 and 20. Melchizedek said, Blessed be Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Do you know, and this is a side note, that Melchizedek um, represents Jesus. And this is just a tangent I want to teach you a little bit. Melchizedek, his name actually means the king of righteousness. What does your name mean? Does anyone know? Well, Melchizedek means the king of righteousness. King of Salem also means he's the king of peace. And the New Testament says he is a type of Christ. That Jesus was from the same line because Jesus was both priest and king. Melchizedek in this account was a mediator between Abram and God. Jesus is the one mediator between, Abram, between us and God. Jesus was the true king of righteousness who gives righteousness to all who cling to him in faith. And so as a tangent, this guy appears giving us a foreshadowing of who Jesus would be as both priest and king. But when Abram sees him and hears that, yes, the victory was from the Lord, he amends that the victory was from the Lord by giving a tenth of all the plunder. And in doing so, again, he honored God gave him the glory and returned to him what was his. 
What our country needs is for many people to rise up and in positions of greatness say, the reason I'm in this company, the reason we won the game, the reason I got the promotion, the reason I got the scholarship, the reason I was successful, it wasn't because of me. Rather, let me tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. When we continue to do that, we prop up the only name that saves, the only name that matters when our name isn't understood or heard anymore. And what else can we do with what is God's? We can return to Him, that faithful portion, out of joy, out of love, out of praise to God. See, I've always thought that there was a reason that the wealthiest country in the world is also the most Christian country in the world. I thought that those things could come together in a dream for revival and spread the name of the Lord as the mission of the Lord is fueled like never before. I don't think it's a coincidence that Christians and wealth come together so that we can proclaim the only name that saves, whether it be in a local church or in churches abroad, whether we send missionaries or whether we send podcasts. There is a reason God has given us so much good and it is to prop up his name and to tell people about his kingdom as we gladly give what was ultimately his anyway this is the greatness that is also needed at this time because I've said the word revival and that is what I hope this country has that is what I hope we experience with the next generation of Christians. See, I, I hear a lot about those millennials, but here's one thing I hope, that those millennials don't lose Jesus. And as long as I'm here, I'm still going to have a heart for the next generation and the previous one. It's not looking down on any of them. But there's never a time where we should say it's okay that they don't know the Lord. That's how we lose the faith. So let us, by our examples of greatness, Continue to do whatever we can for the sake of many others who need to know the Lord. You know, one other thing. I'm going to do a little bit of trash talking. Has anyone ever trash talked to you before? It's on the football field. I won't tell, me, tell you what they said to me. But anyway, um, do you know what they're calling the, the, the Christian church in America? You ready for it? It's trash talk. A sleeping giant. See, educated people have looked over what's happening in Christianity in America and said, we're a giant. We are well represented. The only problem is that we're sleeping. How many more things will it take for us to wake up? How many more events have to occur before we say, I can no longer be apathetic for the name of Jesus. I can no longer do nothing. When others need hope and healing, I will rise up and it's going to start with me. And I hope it continues to you that we are going to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus so that the next generation does know the Lord. May it start with us, my friends, and let me pray for you now. Heavenly Father, these are bold marching orders to be great. And we cannot do it without you. But we, we say that we need you now and the next generation needs you and this world needs you. So let us be a light to many people who are stuck in darkness. And let there be revival in this land. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.